Hi, I'm Chris Kanich, and this is CS361 Systems Programming. Today, we're going to be learning about the different flavors of multitasking that we have available to us and when we're going to pick which one to make sure that we're always using the right tool for the job. So the three main choices we have when it comes to concurrency is to use processes, to use threads, or to use IO multiplexing. And what we've already been doing in class is a lot of stuff with processes. We've used fork, we've used POSIX spawn, we've used execv, and that's really, really good for creating a completely different unit of computation that in a lot of cases, like with a shell, is completely separate from the other task that you're doing, right? Running a bash shell is very, very different from running a code editor or running GCC, but that is concurrency. It just so happens that almost always none of those different processes have anything to do with each other. They're completely separate in what task it is that they are accomplishing. So one of the new concepts we're going to cover beyond processes is the idea of threads. And threads are very, very similar to processes, but have a few slightly different properties that we're going to go over over the course of this lecture. That's probably going to be the main topic of this video. Uh, and finally, I, as just a little bit of a preview for the next video, there's also IO multiplexing. And this is what we're using for our web chat assignment right now, where we're saying, listen, operating system, I'm really happy for you. You're really good at doing this multitasking thing, but I've got to go fast. I've got to go as fast as I possibly can to handle all these different clients that are coming and asking me to chat with each other. I can't wait for you to use your process abstraction or your thread abstraction to get the job done for me. I need to get it done myself as fast as I can. So as we look through these three different options, there's kind of a continuum from one side to the other in terms of which one is good for which job and what properties does it provide to us. So over on this side, we have a lot of isolation between the different tasks. Like I said, it's really, really good for completely separate tasks that say get spawned by a shell because they're perfectly isolated by the operating system. And when we get all the way over here to the other side, we're running in one thread of control, we're running in one process, and we as the programmer are fully in charge of what task gets done when. We've taken all of that over from the operating system and said we're gonna do it internal to our own process. Each of these is a good tool for a different type of job, and we're gonna go over when you're gonna choose which ones based on what situation you find yourself in that you need to do multitasking within your code. So just as a quick refresher, let's remember what exists within a process as we've been talking about it over the course of this semester. Now remember we have our memory image. We'll very often draw that as a big vertical rectangle, right? We've got our text down at the bottom that's behind my head. We've got our data section. We've got our stack, which grows up. And we've got our heap. So we've got all of these different areas of memory that we're gonna use to get our job done. Now remember though, we've got virtual memory addresses or we've got physical memory. We've only got a certain amount of physical memory, but we've got gobs and gobs of virtual memory. So what this will actually look like in virtual memory space is that the text is just a tiny little sliver down here. The data is just a tiny little sliver down here. And then the stack is just a tiny little sliver up here. And the heap is just a tiny little sliver up here. And they're very, very far away from each other in the virtual address space. There's plenty of space between them to do other things, to hold other pieces of important information. In addition to that, we've also got access to our external files. Now the kernel keeps track of which files we have open, what the offset is within those files, what either network connections or physical files on the disk those are connected to, and it takes care of all of that work for us. And then for every individual thread of control, we have both its execution context, all of its activation records, right? It's stack frames that keeps track of every single chunk of code that it has been running. And it's jumping into functions, running them, and then popping back out by returning. Uh, and then at any given very specific moment in time, it has a certain number of values stored in a certain number of registers. So at some point, you know, we have our stack, which keeps track of where we've been. And then we also have our registers, which are where we are right now. What stack frame are we looking at? What register values do we have that we're gonna be computing on? Stuff like that. So when we do multi-processing, using this uh, basic idea of creating two different, completely separate processes, you know, we, we share open file descriptors. Remember when we fork the file descriptors that were open in the parent or the file descriptors that are open in the child. And when we're running a shell, unless we're doing input output redirection, we usually just close those. We don't have them 
connected to each other and the child just goes and does what it's going to do. The parent waits for the child to end or goes and does what it's going to do and they just keep on doing whatever it is they want to do. Uh, this is really, really good for isolating different tasks, especially when they're completely separate from each other. Uh, if you've closed those files, nothing is similar between these two. Remember the really tricky thing about fork is that when it returns, it returns one value in the parent, it returns another value in the child, and even though they're stored at the same exact virtual address, they are going to have different values in them because these two different memory images just diverge perfectly. Like they start out as the same exact thing, but in two different places with the same set of virtual addresses. And anytime there's an edit in one of them, it doesn't show up in the other one. So we're very, very isolated. That's very, very good. But because we're creating a whole new page table, we're creating a whole new process. This is a very heavyweight operation. Process-based multitasking is good because you know it's going to work. You know that you're not gonna clobber your own data in any way like we're gonna see in a moment, but it's also very, very heavyweight. It takes a lot more time for the operating system to create a new process than it would take the operating system to say, create a new thread. So now let's talk about threads. So this whole entire time we've been talking about processes and processes are a very good abstraction to think about the different resources available to your running code. A process, uh, as we've been thinking about it, is a thing that gets put onto the CPU. It does the operations that it needs to do. But in actuality, when Linux is actually saying, I'm gonna run this one or I'm gonna run this one, or Windows is saying, I'm gonna run this one versus I'm gonna run that one, it's actually choosing between different threads of control. And what, we, what we're gonna learn in this specific subsection is that each individual process is kind of just a holding ground for one or more threads of control. What we've been thinking so far is that we have one process and that has one stack and it has one set of register values and it gets its job done. But in actuality, we can have lots of different uh, threads of control within the same process and all of them will have their own individual stack and all of them will be able to run independent of each other. So when we're running code in threads, what we have is the memory image is going to be exactly the same for every single thread within an individual process. And just like with multiprocessing, we're gonna have the same exact set of external resources associated with that process. All of the file descriptors that are open in that process are the same ones that are available to every single thread within that process. But only the stack and the program state are going to be independent for each individual thread. This is good because creating a new thread of control just means create a new stack frame and start running a function on it. Create a new set of registers and start running on them. That's a very, very fast operation compared to creating an entire new memory image, creating an entire new page table, things like that for, for multiprocessing. The other advantage we get out of this is that that memory image is the same for all these different threads. What we'll typically think of when we draw and think about this is that we've got our whole entire memory image and then we can think about our different threads as these like squiggly little lines, right? They're execution contexts that are associated with any given stack. Maybe this one is associated with this stack, this one is associated with this stack, this one is associated with this stack. They're all going to have their own world and no one of them is any more important than any other thread. All of these threads could potentially call exit, which is a system call, which will tell the operating system, hey, terminate this entire process. So if one of them says, oh, I'm done doing my job, I'm gonna call exit, that's not a good idea. That's gonna cause all the other threads to immediately exit as well. And so this is why we have things like pthread exit, which will say, oh, just terminate this one specific thread rather than terminate the entire process itself. We need to start thinking about things in terms of processes are these entire areas where we can do work uh, that have memory associated with them and one or more threads. And threads are very specifically execution contexts which can be put onto the processor. One of the most powerful things that we can do with threads is say I have one chunk of virtual memory and I'm going to operate on it with multiple threads that can actually run on different CPUs at the same moment in time and get things done faster than one clock cycle per clock cycle. Maybe I can do two clock cycles per cycle because I've got two different CPUs that are each running individual threads that are operating on the same memory. The challenge though, 
it goes back to the fact that this memory image is the same for every single thread. If I have a pointer to a global variable down there in my data section and I wipe it out because I'm done using it in thread number one, every single other thread is going to see that same operation done within their own memory because it's the same exact memory. They don't have their own copy on write duplication of that memory like we do in process world. They all share the same memory. This becomes even nastier if you start trying to pass values to other functions on their stack. Right? If I have a stack local variable and I tell the operating system, hey, create a new function and I'm gonna pass in a pointer to a stack local variable I have within my stack. Then all of a sudden you've got a pointer going from one thread stack to another thread stack and it's very likely that you are going to completely mess up the way that your program runs because you don't know what the lifetime is going to be of that individual piece of memory. It becomes very, very tricky and we're losing our isolation. Remember we had that continuum on that previous slide where we can have perfect isolation on one side or we can have no isolation whatsoever on the other side. In thread land, we're kind of in the middle. We get a good amount of isolation. We can run our own threads with our own local variables and we can even do things like malloc an individual chunk of memory and nobody else is gonna have access to it unless they accidentally run into it. And we can have a relatively lightweight mechanism at the same time as having some, but not a whole lot of isolation between the two. So this is the best of both worlds for specific use cases, but it's not always gonna be the best thing you can possibly do. So just to go into a few of those nitty gritty details of how we're gonna be using these things. Processes, we create new ones either using POSIX spawn or using fork. We can wait for them to finish by calling wait PID. And as soon as a new process is created, it has a perfect copy of everything in the parent process's memory. So if it was forked without using POSIX spawn or exec v to wipe out all that memory, it has every single byte stored there. But when it makes changes to its own memory world, those aren't reflected in the parent and vice versa. If the parent makes changes, they're not reflected in the, the child world. Uh, if so, if they do want to communicate with each other, they need to have some way to do so. Uh, the most straightforward way to do that, I think they go over in the book a little bit, where you need a file descriptor to read and write between the two. Because we know that file descriptors are shared between parents and children, we know that we can create a pipe like we do in the shell example, but rather than using it to communicate between one process and another process using standard in and standard out, we can just write directly to the right end of that pipe in the parent and then read out of it in the read end in the child and that allows them to work together. But if they don't choose to do that, they're not gonna have any real way to interoperate. There are also a few other coordination mechanisms they can use. We can actually ask the operating system, hey, I'm going to ask you for some memory using that mmap function, but I want you to make sure that even if I fork myself, there's still only one copy of that memory. So then it becomes explicitly shared memory between the parent and the child, and you can do whatever coordination you need to do to make sure that they can both read from and write to that memory without clobbering each other's reads and writes. On the other hand, we can use threads, and there it's gonna be a little bit similar, where with processes, we were creating entire new programs, like with exactly we're saying, take this program from the disk and run the entire thing. With threads, we're not creating a whole new program. All we're doing is creating a new execution context. And if we think about how programming works, an execution context can kind of be created by calling a function. Like typically, you know, we have a main function, that function calls another function, that function calls another function. Uh, but what we can do here instead is, so what we can do here is we can draw kind of like, here is our memory that we're gonna use for our stack. And here is the activation record of main and main is gonna call work one, and work one is going to call printf, and printf does its thing, and then maybe you return from printf, you go back to doing things in work one, stuff like that. That is how you operate in regular coding. What we can do here is we can say, oh, well, I'm going to create a whole new stack, and if I am in this work one function, and in work one, I call pthread create, Rather than that being a function that creates another uh, activation record on this stack, what pthread create is gonna do is it's gonna say, hey, operating system, rather than creating a new stack frame on this stack, what I want you to do is create a completely separate activation record where whatever function is called via pthread create 
like work two or something like that starts here. Kind of like main's at the bottom of the stack and when you return from main, you're done. Just like with this work two function that I'm launching using pthread create, I'm going to do whatever is in work two, maybe work two is gonna call something, maybe that's gonna call something, it's gonna create its own set of stack frames. But when I return from work two, it just disappears. It's just done with whatever job it was doing and it's no longer necessary. So what I can do in that calling thread, if that calling thread is supposed to be coordinating all of the threads, it can call something like pthread join, which is going to wait for its child threads to complete before it moves on to its next instruction. And if these two different threads want to communicate with each other, it's actually really easy because they all have access to the same global memory. They have access to the same heap as each other. So if I were to malloc something in this work one function and then pass it to a thread I create via pthread create, it's gonna have access to it. It's gonna be able to read from it. It's gonna be able to write to it. And all of those reads and writes will be immediately visible in that coordinator thread that had spawned the worker thread. This is much, much easier than explicitly saying, this is what I'm gonna share, and this is what I'm gonna share, and this is what I'm gonna share in the process model. But it's also a lot more dangerous, right? It's shared there. And if you don't make sure that you leave it in a consistent state whenever you are done using it, and you don't say, hey, I'm gonna start modifying this memory. I'm gonna put it in an inconsistent state while I'm copying things around and fixing things up. And then when I'm finished with it, other people can get it. I need to have some mechanism for locking. And that's what we're gonna see next week in order to kind of protect our memory from being edited in a way that we don't expect or a way that would cause our program to work incorrectly. So at a high level, if we're thinking about when do we wanna use processes? When do we wanna use threads? Here's how we're gonna make that decision. Processes are best suited to completely separate tasks because they have this very high level of isolation provided by the operating system. Nothing is shared between the parent and the child unless you choose it or if it's a file descriptor. Threads, on the other hand, are sharing memory. So they're sharing their heaps, they're sharing their globals, just as if they were different lines of code within the same text, just editing things at different moments in time. The tricky part about threads is that they can run in arbitrary order and they can run at the same exact time. So in general, threads are better for CPU intensive tasks that can be run fully in parallel. Uh, it's also very, very useful when you need to share a lot of data between a, a bunch of different threads. Say again, my, my favorite example, a database. If you have lots of different users that are accessing a little bit of the data here, a little bit of the data there, they're all sharing access to that same exact database. A thread-based model does work well so that you can have one thread serving one user's requests, another thread serving another user's requests. But just like with databases, you have to be very, very careful when you modify that data. When one thread is going to start modifying that data, you have to be very careful to make sure that the other threads don't read things that are corrupted or don't also modify things to leave it in an inconsistent state that will break your program. So if you remember from that initial diagram that I had shown earlier, I didn't really talk about IO multiplexing at all yet. Now IO multiplexing is very, very different in terms of how you write your code. The difference between writing process level multiplexing and thread level multiplexing is at the end of the day, it's very, very similar. You're creating this independent thread of control that the operating system is going to schedule for you and it's gonna swap them in and out using the context switch mechanism. IO multiplexing takes a completely different approach to that. It says, rather than asking the operating system to choose which of my threads or which of my processes is gonna run at any moment in time, I'm gonna say I, as one individual thread of control in one process, I'm going to choose which of the different requests that's coming into me I'm going to serve at any given point in time. So rather than switching between one process and another, I'm gonna switch between serving one input uh, and then another input, and I get to choose when I'm done working on input one and move on to input two. This is very similar to the race car analogy that I like to use. It can be much faster, it can be much more efficient, but in general, it takes a lot more effort and training in order to get good at doing these tasks effectively. That's what we're doing in homework five. And in the next video, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about exactly how those mechanisms work. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you next time.